All right, so just continuing on the topic of hell, and uh, I don't normally give you a title of this sermon, but I just wanted to tell you the title of my sermon. Um, the title of this sermon is Jesus Christ in Hell. I don't know if somebody's used that title before. Um, I'm, not, I'm not, not trying to be original with my titles, just trying to be clear with um, what the sermon's going to be about. So the title is uh, Jesus Christ in Hell. And before I just go to the Bible to um, show you um, that Jesus Christ did go to hell uh, and why he went to hell, um, I just want to talk about the importance of this doctrine because, you know, many people, when they first hear this doctrine and they first hear about Jesus Christ going to hell, it's a shock to them, right? It's a shock to them and they say, how, how dare you? How dare you say Jesus Christ went to hell? How, isn't, it, isn't that blasphemous? Isn't that, you know, how, how can you blaspheme against God? And it's funny that, you know, if you remember watching that conversation between Stephen Anderson and James White, James White made the same accusation, right? When they got onto the topic of Jesus Christ going to hell, James White was just like, how can you say that? That's blasphemous. Um, but you know, the, the funny thing is, is that, oh, I don't know if it's funny, but you know, the interesting thing is, is it's actually the opposite. Because if Jesus Christ didn't go to hell, I believe that's almost blasphemous because you're then saying that Jesus Christ did not fulfill the Old Testament covenant. He didn't fulfill everything that the law required. So he had to have gone to hell. Um, but, you know, why, why, is, why is this um, in, an important topic? You know, wh why is it important that Christ fulfills all the law? It's important because it's required for us to be saved. Because if Jesus Christ did not fulfill every part of the law, then he wasn't a perfect saviour. He didn't fulfill the law like he had to in order for us to be saved. And, and I just wanted to, before I get into this topic in particular, I just wanted to give you another example of something that doesn't seem so important, but is actually part of salvation. Because, you know, in order for Christ to be the saviour, in order for him to die for our sins and be that perfect sacrifice, he had to accomplish certain things. Because some people will say, well, what's more important, the resurrection or the blood? Well, neither are more important. They're both important because if you don't have either of them, then we can't be saved because he had to fulfill the Old Testament law. And it's the same with Jesus Christ going to hell. And I just wanted to talk about quickly another example of this is, you know, the importance of the burial. You know, the, the gospel is the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And sometimes you'll think, you know, what's so important about the burial? You know, I can understand that the lamb had to be slain right and then he had to rise again because he had to you know be, be resurrected the third day and that gives us hope that we will one day rise again but why why is the burial emphasized you know it's the death uh, burial and resurrection well you know there's a couple of reasons why i think the the burial has significance and and number one here just in john 12 it says here and jesus answered them saying the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Um, let's just go here from, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 15. Bible here, this is like the resurrection chapter, but it says here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 35, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain. So number one, one significance of the burial is that it's, um, you know, it symbolizes a truth that's revealed in nature. So in nature, you know, a corn of wheat has to die and has to be buried in the ground. Otherwise, it can't uh, bring forth fruit. So Jesus almost fulfilled that you know, truth that we see in nature, that he, was, he died and then was buried so that he could rise again. Um, so that's number one. It symbolizes the truth revealed to us in nature. Number two, if we go uh, further up. Uh, this is one I heard. Because we remember here it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So another reason I've heard is the burial is important because it proves a bodily resurrection. Because the body died and then the body was buried because you can't bury the spirit, you can't bury the soul. And then the body rose again the third day because cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in a bodily, 
physical resurrection, but we do. Because, you know, when Jesus came back, he ate with the disciples. He said, here, touch and feel. You know, spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me to have. So the burial is important there because it, it symbolizes or it, it proves to us that it was a bodily resurrection because the body was buried, the body rose again. So those are some significances there. But I think the most important thing um, about the resurrection, oh, sorry, about the burial, just go here. And, and what I'm sort of tying it in with why Jesus Christ had to go to hell is because it fulfilled the Old Testament law. I don't know if you've ever read this verse. There's only two verses in Deuteronomy. But just, just look at these two verses in Deuteronomy 21. It says, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, it's, it's interesting because I always worried, wondered what the importance of the burial was until, you know, because sometimes when you're reading through the Bible, you're sort of just like glancing over verses. And then I realized this verse was here. And then I realized that's why the burial is important. Because there's actually a law in the Old Testament that says if, you, if somebody is a curse of God, if somebody's worthy of death, right, worthy of capital punishment, and we know that Christ was not worthy of capital punishment, but he became sin for us, right? So that's why he was worthy of death, because he took on the sins of the world. And it says here, if this person is worthy of death and you hang him on a tree, meaning that, you know, he's, he's crucified, basically, you hang him up. And, and it's funny how, you know, some people will say, you know, the, um, it was the Romans that came up with crucifixion, you know, hanging people on a tree. I don't know if that's really true, because you see people getting hanged on a tree before the Romans. You know, so it just goes to show that sometimes history is not always the truth. We should always go to the Bible. Maybe it wasn't so much crucifixion, you know, because you know, you, you, they, they, they killed him and they hang him on a tree. So maybe, maybe they're right there in the sense that crucifixion is where you're suffering on this tree as opposed to maybe put to death and then hung up on a tree for shame's sake, right? But anyways, if, you, if you're put to death and you're hung up on a tree... The Bible says here that that day that person has to be buried, otherwise the land is still defiled for the sin that they've committed. So you can see here that if Jesus Christ was not buried, I don't believe the sins would have been taken away, right? Because that's one of the things that needed to happen in order for the plan of salvation to be complete. So even though it seems like a seemingly insignificant statement that the, the gospel is the death of burial and resurrection, everything is important. And just springboarding off that, this is why the doctrine of Jesus Christ going to hell um, is important. And, you know, even though a lot of people are shocked when they first hear this doctrine and they say, how can you say Jesus Christ went to hell? You know, my honest first reaction when I, when I learned about Jesus Christ going to hell, to me, it was, it was refreshing in the sense of I could never reconcile how a physical death and a physical suffering paid for an eternity of hell. Do you know what I mean? Like, if, 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 if we're going to say, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the punishment for sin is an eternity of fire and brimstone and burning, yet Jesus Christ, in order to satisfy that judgment, just died, suffered physically and died physically, to me, that never made sense. So then when I learned, oh, no, wait, Jesus Christ's soul actually went to hell and burned and suffered for our sins, then it was like, ah, that, that sort of reconciled that, that fantasy in my own mind. Not that my, my own judgments you know, matter, but to me it just was refreshing because that made sense to me and said, hey, great, you know, that made sense that you know, the punishment is this and the punishment was paid with something that was equal to it as opposed to something that seemed in my own mind not as, um, as, as uh, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for, like intent? Uh. That's not the word. Severe. Not as severe. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, if the punishment for sins is hell, wouldn't it make sense for Christ to go there in order to be our substitute and fulfill the law? Now, another question that came up before I go into um, the points that I have here. You know, Kevin and I were discussing. Now, did, did Jesus Christ, because some people debate this question. Did Jesus Christ go to hell to suffer for our sins, you know, to suffer and be punished? 
Or did he just go to hell to um, take ownership of hell, you know, to get the keys of death and of hell? So he didn't actually uh, go there to burn and to suffer. He did go to hell. That's why we have those verses in the Bible. This is the argument. He did go to hell, but it was a bit like, um, you know, uh, the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. Like he was there, but they weren't being burnt. And he was just there to preach to the spirits in prison um, and to take the keys of death and of hell. Now, my, my, my position is, you know, I, I believe he did burn and he did suffer. And I'll, I'll explain why I believe that as opposed to him just going there just to, to preach to the spirits in prison and take the keys um, as we go through um, these points. So I've got seven reasons here, seven biblical reasons uh, why Jesus Christ went to hell. And, you know, normally in my sermons, I was, talking about, I was talking about this with my wife last night, normally in my sermons, I normally start off with like the least obvious passage and then sort of build up to a climax, like the nail in the coffin. But I thought I, I'd, I'd just try the other way around this time. And this time I'll just start with the clearest verse and then show you the consistency of the Bible with supporting verses. So um, let's go to my first point. 16.8. All right, so number one, the first reason, first biblical reason why Jesus Christ went to hell. We read here in Psalm 16, it says here, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now this is why we have to be careful with Old Testament passages, right? And especially in the Psalms, because we know that the Psalms are, are songs written by people, but they often have a, a spiritual meaning. And that's why, you know, if you would apply this to the person actually who wrote or spoke the Psalm through the Holy Spirit, it doesn't always make sense. Because David wrote this Psalm and he spoke this Psalm and he's talking about um, you know, God not leaving his soul in hell. How does that make sense? Well, we don't have to guess because we are actually explained by the Apostle Peter uh, what this verse actually means. So we go to Acts 2, um, verse 25. And it says here in uh, Acts 2, it says, For David speaketh concerning him. Uh, who's the him? Jesus Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. So this is the same psalm, Psalm 16. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And now look, the apostle, uh, Peter the Apostle goes on to explain here in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. So he's saying, guys, David wrote this psalm and he preached this psalm, but let me tell you that David is dead and we still have his grave here today. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So that's interesting there that David knew about Jesus Christ. He knew about this son that would come and be risen again. Um, he seeing this, look at this, verse 31. He seeing this, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, so who's the his? That Christ's soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. So this, you know, we could stop at this point and just know that Jesus Christ went to hell because the Bible says here that Acts 16, even though David was preaching and saying, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy uh, one to see corruption. The Bible says here that that is actually David being a prophet preaching about what Christ was going to fulfill, what Christ was actually going to do. And it says there in verse 31 that he seeing this, so David seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh should see corruption. 
Look here in verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. <clears throat> Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that, that same Jesus whom ye had crucified, both Lord and Christ. So from Acts 2.31, we could just stop at that point and just know Jesus Christ went to hell and leave it at that. But some people might say, well, you know, maybe you're not understanding it properly. You know, you shouldn't just take one verse and just run with it. So let's look at a couple of other reasons why um, Jesus Christ went to hell besides the plain fact that, Pe the, that Peter the Apostle expounded on Psalm 16 and clearly explained to us that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. Now, one thing I just want to note here as well, uh, it says here <coughs> in verse 27, it says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, uh, sorry, verse 26, Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Now, this is one reason why I believe Jesus Christ did go and he did suffer in hell rather than just going there to take ownership of hell. Because if he just went there just to take ownership of hell and he wasn't burning, he wasn't suffering, why was his soul resting in hope? You know, why was he there saying, you know, my soul shall rest in hope for that will not leave my soul in hell. It's almost like he didn't want to be there. But if he was just there to, to get the keys, it seemed like... You know, what, what was the big deal? Why, why is he resting in hope? He knew he was going to get out. He knew he, he, he was uh, just going there just to, uh, to, to take ownership. Uh, why would he have this, uh, this despair right? or this, this hope that one day he was going to get out? So that's uh, one thing there. All right, number two. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. And I just want to see, see here that it's not just one verse that shows that Jesus Christ went to hell. But the Bible is amazingly consistent when it comes to this doctrine. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, we see here in verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So talking about sins, right, in the church. Verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we see here in the New Testament the spiritual significance of the Passover feast and the unleavened bread. But this is what's interesting, because it says here in 1 Corinthians 5, that uh, in verse 7 it says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So the New Testament Passover, which we keep, which is, you know, being unleavened, you know, being like trying to abstain from sin in the church and uh, being that unleavened bread, Christ being our Passover, the sacrifice for us. If we actually go back to Exodus and actually see how the nation of Israel was instructed to hold the Passover, we'll see something um, interesting. Let's go there. Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of, of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out, of, out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So there was a certain day in the month of Abib that this Passover lamb had to be killed. And just touching back on, you know, when I said, you know, the importance of the burial, and importance of fulfilling the law. I mean, if Jesus Christ did not get killed on this exact day, he wouldn't have fulfilled the Old Testament covenant. So that's important too. All the timings are important. That's why, he, that's why Jesus Christ, what he accomplished was a miracle. 
You know, because it's not just the fact that he died and buried and rose again. He did it according to the scriptures. Remember, the Bible says that. First Corinthians 15, 3. And that's why it's just amazing because he actually did it according to the scriptures. And um, yeah, like just fulfilling all that, it just, uh, that's what makes it a miracle. Uh, not, not so much just that he, I mean, even just dying and rising again is already a miracle, but then fulfilling it all according to the law just is the nail in the coffin for anyone trying to dispute whether or not Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Um, and they shall take of the blood, verse 7, and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Look at this. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. So saying, don't eat the lamb raw, uncooked. Don't eat the lamb boiled with water, sodden at all with water. But look, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on, your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 5, says Christ our Passover is our sacrifice for us. And then when we go back to the Old Testament in Exodus, where we see the instruction of how they were to fulfill the Passover, God makes it a specific point to say, don't eat the lamb raw, don't eat the lamb boiled, but you must burn it with fire. And I think it's just interesting that it lines up with the fact that Jesus Christ went to hell. And, you know, this is another reason why I don't believe he just went there and wasn't burned. I believe he went there and was burned and suffered because the lamb had to be burnt. It had to be a sacrifice. Um, and that's why I believe Jesus Christ did go there and suffer and burn because he was fulfilling this role in being this sacrifice, in being this substitute and burning uh, as a sim symbolism of taking our place. And I think it's interesting. So they're, they're, the Passover has these significances, right? That, that Jesus Christ is the Passover. We are meant to keep that feast by being the unleavened bread because they ate the feast with unleavened bread and we're to keep that feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity. And, um, but, you know, also, it's interesting here that it says here in verse 11, And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So it's just interesting that there's always these spiritual significances, and we can always, you know, I, I guess, think about what they mean. But he's saying here that when they ate the Passover, they had to be ready to leave, right? They had their, their, their shoes on, they were, their loins were girded, and we know in the Old Testament, because after they ate that Passover, they were about to enter you know, into the wilderness and go through the Jordan, over the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land. So there are a couple of things in this verse 11. It says you eat it with haste. And one thing I think that symbolizes is you know, when people hear about the Savior, they hear about um, Jesus Christ dying and rising for them to, again, they need to be believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. You know, the Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So it's saying here that when they ate, when they killed the lamb, they learned about the death, burial, and resurrection. They ought to eat that lamb with haste. Don't put off salvation. Don't put it off um, until tomorrow. You know, they say that the salvation left till tomorrow is the tragedy of too late. So that's our one significance there in verse 11. But the other thing it says there that you eat it ready to go. And the significance we can get from that is when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we don't just keep it to ourselves. We're ready to go into battle. We're ready to share Jesus Christ with other people. So a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I just got saved. I just want to learn some things first before I get involved with the soul winning, before I get involved with church. No, the Bible says here that when you get saved, you ought to get saved with the mindset that you're ready to work. Yes, works don't save us at all. You know, it's not about repenting of your sins or keeping the commandments. But what's ideal? Ideally, you get saved and then you're ready to go, do the work straight away. And, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, them going into the promised land is a picture of heaven. And it is. It's them entering into rest. But remember, when they entered into rest, it wasn't rest straight away, right? Because they had to wander through the wilderness. They had to go through all that. They had to cross the Jordan River. And then when they crossed the Jordan River, there was all the wars that needed to take place and all the claiming of the inheritance. 
And that's what we're in now, right? We haven't entered into the rest period now. Now we've crossed the Jordan River, right? We've been baptized into Moses and, uh, and, and, and in the sea. And now we're doing the work. Now we're claiming our inheritance. And that's why it's interesting in the Old Testament that the inheritance was actually handed out according to the number of the tribes. Because I think that actually symbolizes how much work you do for God. How many souls did you influence? How many souls did you influence and help win to the kingdom of God? Because that's going to determine your inheritance when we go into the rest. So there's all these, uh, these spiritual significances here. And I just think it's very interesting that God is very specific with these certain things. And the Passover lamb had to be burnt with fire, symbolizing that Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins. So number one, it was pl plainly preached by the Apostle Peter, uh, by Peter the Apostle. I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to uh, call him Peter the Apostle because I'm trying like, not to give him a title, right? Because I'm like, we don't have titles. So it's Peter the Apostle. It's not the Apostle Peter. <laughs> so it was plainly preached by Peter the Apostle. Um, number two, the instructions given to the nation of Israel for the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ being our Passover, and the Passover was burnt. Now let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Oh. And I sort of touched on this, but um, number three is Christ's soul, not his body, was the sin offering. So it was Christ's soul and not his body that was the sin offering. And why did Jesus Christ have to pay for our sins? Because the Bible says here in verse uh, 20, Now then we, as we are ambassadors for Christ. So we just touched on that about the soul winning. Uh, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I sort of touched on this in my introductions. You know, it made sense to me that if sin was punished by everlasting fire, if Christ was made sin for us, doesn't that make sense that Christ then would then suffer that eternal fire in place of us um, if he took our sin for us? You know, the Bible says that he himself bear our sins in his own body on the tree. So he bare our sins. He, he became sin in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So taking that sin, he then went uh, and was punished in hell for that. Uh, let's just go to John 3.14. And this is why it's interesting, because in John 3.14, the Bible says here, Jesus talking about himself, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Um, and sometimes people wonder, why was Jesus Christ being lifted up and that symbolized as a serpent being lifted up? Well, the reason is because Jesus Christ became sin for us. So that's why there's a serpent. And then in the Old Testament, when they looked at the serpent that was risen up, the brazen serpent, they lived symbolizing Jesus Christ, you say, well, how can, oh, isn't that blasphemous that Jesus Christ is symbolized by a serpent? No, because he became sin for us. He became evil, and that's why he can be symbolized as a serpent lifted up, because when he was lifted up on that cross, he, he his own self, bare our sins in his own body on the tree. Um, so Jesus Christ became sin. But let's go to Isaiah 53. And we'll just read through this chapter here. It says... Uh, We'll go from verse 3, and we read about the suffering of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. So there's that becoming sin for us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. 
I think that symbolism there is like the Passover lamb, right? Brought to be killed. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So we'll just stop there first and we'll say, you know, see, he w the suffering was there, the beating, the physical suffering and death was there. And people might say, yeah, well, that's the thing, Isaiah 53, it just talks about the physical beating and the suffering, but he didn't burn in hell. But let's read on, and this is why I believe that he did suffer in hell. Uh, it says here, and he had made, look, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So we've already read about the physical pain and suffering that Jesus Christ went through. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So just take note of that, that his soul was an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So there's that becoming sin for us. But look at what the Bible says here. He says, he, I believe talking about God, shall see the travail of his soul. So the travail of Jesus Christ's soul burning in hell to be that offering. Because remember the Passover lamb was burnt. Jesus Christ's soul, not his body, was the offering for sin. So his soul now is fulfilling that by burning in hell. And he's in travail. You see? So that's why I believe that there was suffering here. Um, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall, be, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So that's another reason why I believe that there was suffering involved. Um, but see, the soul was the, was the offering for sin, um, as we see there in verse 10, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. See, the body of Jesus Christ was never burnt. Do you see? So that's why the soul had to be burnt, and the soul can only be burnt in hell. The soul can't be burnt on earth. So just another reason why um, uh, we believe Jesus Christ went to hell. So we see the, the bruising, the grief, and the travail of his soul. Um, I don't see how like he, there couldn't be any suffering um, if, when it uses those sorts of words. Okay, let's go on to uh, number four. The fourth reason why uh, we believe Jesus Christ went to hell. Number four is the sign of Jonah the prophet. So Matthew 12, 38 says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus Christ is saying here that Jonah was a sign to them that of Jesus Christ uh, being who he said he was. And he says here that as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the heart of the whale, so the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now his body only went about six feet under, right, in the tomb. I mean, maybe the tomb was an above ground tomb, which means it didn't even go inside the earth. But it says here that the Son of Man shall spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And we talked about last week that the heart of the earth is the current location of hell, showing us that Jesus Christ was in hell. But see, what's interesting about the sign of the prophet Jonah is that we don't even have to guess because when we go to um, the book of Jonah, we see here something interesting about how, what Jonah actually preached in his book. Look here in Jonah 2. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. So this is another reason why I believe that there was suffering uh, involved and, and it not, wasn't just um, taking ownership of the keys. Look at this. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. Look at this. 
Out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now, did Jonah go to hell? No, he was in the fish's belly. But isn't it interesting that when he cries out of the fish's belly, he says, out of the belly of hell, cried I. Um, and just like David, when he said, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, Jonah obviously did not go to hell, but he's preaching from the perspective of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is there suffering in hell, just like Jonah was in the well of the belly suffering. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and thy, and thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, Look at this, even to the soul. So again, the consistency there of Jesus Christ's soul being that burning offering, right, and going to hell. Even to the soul, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. And there's a lot of symbolism between Jonah and Jesus Christ. You know that weeds wrapped about the head, they say is that crown of thorns. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, and the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. You know, we talked about we don't, nobody knows what's inside the earth. You know, they, they do their bouncing of waves down there, and they try and figure out what's down there. I always, the theory of mine was always interesting, that maybe in the earth, because hell maybe is not a solid place. You know, there's this cavity that is hell where all the souls are burning. And then there's the bars holding up the earth. So maybe in the earth there are these iron bars, right, that are actually holding up the earth to not sort of compress into hell. And that's why maybe uh, hell is referred to as a prison and the Bible says here, the earth with her bars was about me forever. I mean, it could just be, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, an analogy, you know, and not actually physically saying that there are bars down, down there. But maybe there is, you know, and maybe there are bars down there and maybe that's why it's referred to as a prison, as if like a prison has bars because they're the bars of hell holding the earth up. Uh, just an interesting thought there. So number four is the sign of Jonah the prophet. Because when the sign was the son of man shall spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then we see here that, you know, the heart of the earth being where hell is. And then we go to the book of Jonah and we see here Jonah is even saying that he's crying out of the belly of hell, even though he did not uh, go to hell. All right, so that's number four. Number five, let's go to Revelation 1.18. And this is where we see that verse about the keys of hell and of death. But reason number five, I believe Jesus Christ went to hell, is because Jesus Christ was dead. Look at what it says here in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus Christ died, right? He died, yes, physically, but he also had to die spiritually. Um, let just keep that just keep that thought in mind. Let's look at another, a few others. Hebrews two, verse nine. Look at this. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, and then and there's the suffering again. So that's why I believe that there was suffering. Oh, you could just say that's the physical suffering, I suppose. Suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So Revelation 1.18 says that he was dead, now I'm alive forevermore, I have the keys. Hebrews 2.9 says he, 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 he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, and that he tasted death for every man. But you might read those two verses and say, well, but Jesus Christ did die, right? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. Um, let me just show you this verse, John 11.25. Jesus says here, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So Jesus Christ is saying here that he, remember he, we, we read that Jesus Christ was dead. And we read that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. But then we read here that who, whoever believes in Jesus Christ, um, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. So you see here that somebody that believes in Jesus Christ never actually dies. So if Jesus Christ only died physically, 
He only suffered physically and then did not go to hell to suffer eternal death for us. Then he didn't truly die, did he? Because Jesus is saying here as a believer, you know, all our bodies die because all of us are going to be separated from our body, but we don't truly die because the moment we breathe our last breath, our next breath is our soul in heaven living, you know, eternal life with Jesus Christ. So the soul must go to hell in order for somebody to experience death and Jesus Christ did die. So he, we see that he was dead. We see that he uh, experienced the suffering death and taste death for every man. And then we read here that you must die spiritually to actually die. And that's why Jesus Christ had to die both physically and spiritually. So Jesus Christ suffered in spiritual death. So that's number five. Number six, I've got two more. And these ones are a bit shorter. Number six is we see that Jesus Christ descended before he ascended. Uh, let's go to First Peter 3.18. Okay, it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and, and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So we see there that you know he was he died, and then he went to preach to the spirits in prison, and then um, he he rose again from the dead, right? And it talks about the the, the baptism being the, the picture of him rising again from the dead by the resurrection of Jesus Christ in verse twenty one. So not so clear a verse, but we just see there the same events unfolding, right? The fact that Jesus Christ died, his soul then descended into hell, and then he rose again from the dead. So here it says that he died, he was quickened by the Spirit, but by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And we believe that that prison is hell, and he went there. So I guess one purpose of going to hell was not just to suffer and, and burn for our sins, but also to, to say something to the people that were there, obviously. So I don't know what he said, um, but he said something to them when he was there because he preached unto the spirits in prison. Uh, look here in Ephesians 4. We'll read from verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, there's that ascension at the day of Pentecost, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Because remember, he gave the Holy Spirit to them after he left. <coughs> Now that he ascended, look at this, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So here Ephesians is saying that Christ, the same Christ that ascended, descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So what's in the lower parts of the earth? It's hell, isn't it? He descended first into the lower parts of the earth before he ascended into heaven. So number six, my point is that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth before he ascended into heaven. And I just want to give you one last point. And I sort of touched on this last week and I just added it to my list. But it's good because it sort of made it seven in that nice complete number. Uh, Matthew 16. Go to verse 18. And I sort of alluded to this last week, just sort of giving us another take on this verse. Uh, the Bible says here, bless it. Uh, verse 16, let's read from there. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I just sort of gave, gave you another take on this verse, saying that the it, that it's not that hell, the gates of hell are not prevailing against, is actually the rock and not the church. And that would actually line up with what we've learned today about Jesus Christ going to hell to pay for our sins, and then rising out of hell and overcoming death and proving that he is the owner of hell, that he has the power to overcome death, that it says here that he's going to build the church on this rock, on Jesus Christ, 
and the gates of hell won't prevail against it because he goes to hell, the rock went to hell, and the gates of hell can't keep him in because he has the keys of death and hell, and he rose from the dead and overcame hell. So this could be another verse that supports the fact that Jesus Christ went to hell, the fact that the gates of hell will, will not or would not and, and cannot keep him in. So seven reasons why you know, Jesus Christ went to hell. Number one, it was just plainly said by Peter the Apostle. Um, the instructions regarding the Passover lamb, the fact that Christ was our Passover and the Passover had to be burnt. Uh, Jesus Christ soul being the offering for sin. And how do you burn the body? You know, you, his body was not burnt. His soul was burnt. The sign of Jonah the prophet and the fact that Jonah said out of the belly of hell cried I. The fact that, number five, Jesus Christ was dead and you have to die spiritually as well as physically to, in order to truly die. Number six, Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth before he ascended to heaven. And number seven, the gates of hell will not keep him in there. He prevailed against the gates of hell. So just a couple of closing thoughts. You know, what are some conclusions from this sermon? So, you know, number one is, this is, why is it important? I know at first people think, oh, that sounds weird that Jesus Christ would go to hell. But hopefully you understand now why it's important because he had to do it to fulfill the Old Testament. He had to fulfill the judgment and justice of God uh, for becoming uh, the sin for us. Because of course, uh, Jesus Christ doesn't deserve to go to hell. You know, Jesus Christ was sinless, but if he becomes sin for us, now he does deserve hell, right? Because he, he takes on the sin for us and that's why he had to go there to pay for it. So it's important that he fulfills the Old Testament law. Otherwise, we cannot be saved because our sins have not been paid for. But another thing to think about, it's great. Thank God that Jesus Christ did go to hell because it means we don't have to. That's why we don't have to go to hell because Jesus Christ is our substitute. He did it for us. Thank God for that. And we have something to be grateful for. Number three, it proves that he has power over hell. Right? He has the keys of death and hell. Uh, it just proves that Jesus Christ is the most powerful out there because he's not only the king of life, but he's the king of death as well. He's the king of everything. He's the owner of everything. Owner of heaven, he's also the owner of hell. But it also shows that Jesus Christ, this is my last point, Jesus Christ is an eternal being. Because if Jesus Christ was just a man, how does a man pay for an eternity of hell? But the fact that Jesus Christ was able to pay for an eternity of judgment proves that he was an infinite being. Because you say like, well, wait a second, you know, yeah, okay, he went to hell, but he only went to hell for three days and three nights. And I suppose this is just something that we do have to just build our thinking on from the Bible. Because how can three days in hell pay for an eternity of hell? Well, it can't if Jesus Christ was just a man. But if Jesus Christ was hell, he fulfilled it according to the scriptures, like Jonas, three days and three nights in the well of the belly. He was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Because did, did he have to take three days? It's kind of like creation. Now, God didn't have to take six days, but he took six days to give us a pattern for the working week. That's where we get the seven-day week, six days and then one day of rest. So Jesus Christ didn't have to do it in three days. He could have done it in a second, right? But he did it in three days to fulfill the Old Testament, right? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But it just goes to show that Jesus Christ can fulfill an eternity of hell in three days and three nights. Why? Because he's an eternal being, which proves that he's God. Because only God could do that. Only God could take an eternity of hell because a man would have to be there for eternity. So I hope that's interesting for you. Um, and I got one more. I actually had a couple of points about hell, but this one became its own point, And I think you'll appreciate that I did not do the other two points. Um, so we'll continue the topic next week on hell. And I've got a couple of other things to talk about. And I hope this has been interesting for you. All right, let's pray.